All right, we're rolling here in the Peak District. So we're here on Stanton Moor. This is uh, a truly ancient landscape. Earlier on, we were looking at some walls left by farmers not long ago. But as we look down here, we can actually see a landscape that has probably been here more or less in a similar sort of fashion for four, five thousand years. It's a very special, mystical feeling to this place. So we're here on Stanton Moor in the Peak District. It's been a long time since I've been out filming any sort of history, so this is really, really exciting. Three months of lockdown, finally back at it. This is it, folks. If you're watching this in the future, please ignore my apparent lack of enthusiasm back in the summer of 2020. Bleary-eyed and confused, I'd just emerged from a quarter of a year spent away from the glorious delights of the great outdoors. Far away from history and the beauty of archaeological landscapes. It was a time spent watching the Tiger King and getting smashed in the garden. Unfortunately, not filming at any historical sites. As 2021 dawns, I now look back on this first excursion of 2020 as a time of innocence. It couldn't get any worse, they said. Well, anyway, let's go back in time a bit. My name's Pete Kelly, and this is my mate Owen. Back in those heady days of mid-2020, during a brief lull between two national lockdowns, we headed out into the wilds to find stone circles, prehistoric monuments, and ancient quarries. Today, we're headed to a landscape that's changed little in 5,000 years. It's a place coated with archaeological evidence and a rich corpus of stories and legends. Let's go. So I'm here on the peaks. This is Darley Dale. And as you can see, it's quite an incredible landscape. These massive hewn rocks strewn all around. This was once used by Bronze Age people to quarry out the stones that they used to make their monuments that litter this vast landscape. Not many trees around. They were all cleared in the Neolithic times. And uh, after that, this was a Bronze Age landscape. So you had people crossing over the sea from mainland Europe. Early primitive seafaring people bringing metallurgy with them across the sea. And there's a good argument that it was those sorts of people who brought horses to Britain for the first time. People who had their roots out on the steppes of Inner Asia many hundreds of years before, before moving into Europe to conquer the early Neolithic farmers who had spread over from Anatolia. And now for something completely different. Or is it? In 1901, a new story was published in England. Today regarded as one of the most famous ever written. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hound of the Baskervilles was an instant hit. And like many of the great stories of England, The Lord of the Rings, 
Harry Potter even. I think the trolls left the dungeon. There's a good reason for this success. Alongside the excellent prose, realistic characters and evocative intrigue. The Hound of the Baskervilles tapped into something deeper, lying dormant underneath the surface of conservative Victorian society. For beneath the whimsy of Sherlock and Watson, the heart of the story, the Hound itself, speaks of a much older time. A rich folklore developed over thousands of years. In every corner of the island. It spoke of a primal fear long held in Britain and elsewhere. A legend that's been with humankind for as long as anyone can remember. Seen on scratch marks on church doors in East Anglia. On moors and wild places the island over. Even in a Led Zeppelin track. It's the tale of the Black Dog. The concept of a great bestial hound that once harried the dark roads of Britain in pre-modern times. All over the UK, there are legends and tales of ghostly animals, often appearing to solitary travellers on isolated roads. The apparitions are almost always dark, jet black, and often of gigantic size. They can take the form of pigs, donkeys, even a great black ram, which may have given Derbyshire its mascot. Still worn by the football club today. But mostly, they are hounds. Huge, monstrous, demonic creatures that speak of the time when magic still lived in the world. And Stanton Moor is no exception. One such story concerns the small village of Bradwell. On a cold winter's evening, two brothers, deep in their pints, emerged from a local pub. Heading down through the long country road, winding through hedgerows and grasping trees, Suddenly, they're confronted by a huge black dog. Eyes glowing red, mouth frothing, padding up and down the path before them. What are you? But only one of the brothers can see the apparition. What are you, pal? The two men, both miners, head off with very different conclusions. You've had one too many bloody pints, mate. Tapped you are. The next day, the one who'd seen the apparition, convinced he'd received a warning, stayed at home. The other went to the mines. Later on that day, he was killed in a terrible accident. The concept of a portent of an impending disaster is a common theme for the legend of the Black Dog. Sometimes even acting as guides to help lost people find their way. Though the story also speaks of a real past, 
when very genuine, large predators still prowled the hidden forest depths outside the scattered villages people lived in. For that was the time when wolves still roamed. And not too much earlier, bears. It's possible that these legends remain as half-remembered reflections of that ancient time. Not too long ago, when the forest and the wilderness between settlements was a fearful place, still stalked by predators with a taste for human flesh. Indeed, one story from Worm Hill near Buxton not too far from the old domain of the Wolf Hunt family. Famed for their skill at hunting wolves in the royal forests, is often said to be concerned with one of those last wolves to live in England. In legend, seen running and leaping with unnatural speed along the local roads. The last of its kind, it said, bearing a grudge against all humanity. And of course, Stanton Moor has its own black dog legend, a great phantom beast said to stalk the desolate moor. In archaeology too, this is an important place. More than 70 ancient barrows stand fixed on the landscape. Mostly on the southern side of the moor, and often difficult to discern. In the world of Tolkien, it was places like this that inspired the Barrow Downs, on the borderlands between the Shire and Rivendell. resting place of the ancient kings of old. Very aware of the old legends of England, Tolkien's unfortunate hobbits aren't careful enough with their wanderings. Failing to heed the warning signs, they approach one of the barrows from the wrong side, and thus they awaken the spirits of the dead. Perhaps it was a similar feeling for the Anglian tribe, later known as the Pacansete, or Peaklanders, when they first ventured into this region in the 5th and 6th centuries AD. Finding ancient barrows there, built by who knows who, long before their own ancestors arrived on the island. They knew the mounds were important though, and a strange coincidence, for the Peaklanders too were barrow builders. One of the most famous being situated at Benty Grange. Excavated during the 19th century, it was found to be the grave of a warrior. containing one of the very few Anglo-Saxon helmets ever found. Long before Sutton Hoo, this was the most important archaeological discovery from that age. Somewhat bringing the early Middle Ages out of the realm of myth and legend into reality. It's probable that at least some of those stories told around Hearthfire during that early Anglo-Saxon age still live on with us today. On Stanton Moor, 
the barrows were excavated slightly later. Between 1927 and the early 1950s, by local archaeologist J.C. Heathcote and his son. Their grave goods now exhibited in nearby Birchover Museum. They did indeed contain the rulers of old, for those barrows were the last resting places of Bronze Age beaker folk. People who lived 2,500 years before the Peaklanders. And there's more. We don't know for sure. The dating is still somewhat confused. But the Beaker folk, apparently newcomers to Britain, may well have been some of the stone circle builders either inheriting the tradition from Britain's Neolithic farmers or building anew. For Stanton Moor has four Bronze Age stone circles. The most famous of all is one of the most visited in the whole country, the Nine Ladies. In legend, a group of women turned to stone for daring to dance on the Sabbath. A tenth, the king stone standing nearby, is said to be the fiddler who played the music. But that's a story for another time. Three other stone circles lie largely hidden and forgotten on the moor. Overgrown and unvisited amongst the heather. Not too far away, yet another stone circle stands at Dull Tor. The purpose for all of these? Well, there are many theories, but in reality, no one knows for sure. But it's not just ancient worshippers this landscape attracts. Today, it's still an important place for modern pagans. A wishing tree stands nearby, decorated with offerings and prayers. A number of modern cairns sit on the landscape too, removed from their predecessors nearby by some 4,000 years. Of course, these days, it's not very fashionable or credible to believe in a giant black dog. But there are other, more modern myths and legends here too, that are more acceptable. For those visiting at night, particularly at the trig point, the highest on the moor, may catch a glimpse of a UFO. And if not, if they're lucky, they will see an incredible view of the night sky. For these are some of the darkest skies in the Midlands, an excellent spot for stargazing an activity that may well have been carried out here for thousands upon thousands of years. My name's Pete Kelly. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and let me know what you think in the comments. There are so many more adventures on the way.